Eternal God, our Father, we just want to thank you so much for the beauty of the Sabbath and through this time of fellowship. We thank you, Lord, for the services that we've already enjoyed and just ask now that you would be with us in this segment, that what will be said and what will be uh, shared, Lord, will be a benefit to all of us here. We ultimately, we ultimately, Lord, we want to be saved in your kingdom and we want to conduct ourselves in a manner that's pleasing to you, both in and out of our homes, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Okay. Can we get our chair? Okay. Okay. This afternoon, we're going to be dealing with a, um, a topic that um, we believe is very, 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 very important for every member of the family. We believe that uh, the married couples that are present here. How many married couples have in the audience today? Okay, quite a few. Okay, how many single individuals? Okay, okay. This benefits everyone because it, it de deals with, um, with communication. And it's one of the three reasons why we, we've entitled this, this uh, presentation, You Say That to Say What? Because even though we may even speak the same language, we, um, we have different ways in which we perceive that and understand what, what, we, what we say. And many times where our communication goes awry is how we talk to each other uh, and communicate inside of our homes. Because admittedly, many of us will speak one way in terms of how we talk to our families and then a whole different way in when we talk to somebody outside of our home. In many respects, I can think that we can safely say that in some respects, we are nicer to people outside of our families, but more so than the people inside of our families. Can I get a witness? <laughs> Reluctantly. <laughs> that was a reluctant amen. But, so we're going to talk about communication, and then it's going to be an interactive um, 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 session this afternoon. It's not just going to be Carmen and I talking. Um, we want, to, want you to be involved in this, and... You can feel free to break in on us at any time with comments or questions. And um, we will also learn a lot from, from you. One of the things that, that uh, I think the beauty of, uh, of, of, a con of this congregation, international congregation, um, is that we come from different places. And um, um, Carmen and I will share with you the, even the communication difficulty that we had. Her, she being Puerto Rican, I'm come from um, the U.S., and, uh, and the southern part of the U.S. Uh, uh, for, that, for that matter. And uh, so things are a little different in the way, that we, the, the way that we communicate with each other. Here's a spiritual rule that we're going to operate from um, that we established today. God is constantly communicating. He created by speaking. Throughout Bible, throughout Bible history, he has com constantly communicated to and through men and women in his living word, Jesus, and his written word. We were originally made in God's image, like him possessing the ability to communicate. When mankind chose to sin, their communication skills came under the domination of God's enemy. Our role as children of God is to restore our to restore our ability to communicate God's love, his character, and his plan of restoration. So sin affected everything. And it starts right, with, right from the Garden of Eden. When you look at, at Genesis 1 and 2 in the, in the Bible, everything was harmonious with that, with that, with that family setup. God uh, set up everything perfectly. And everything was uh, about us, we, and, and, and we are, and us. Uh, in that. And if we had my way, I wish I could have stopped and stopped, the Bible could have ended at Genesis chapter 2. Come on, say amen. amen. The, the problem started after Genesis 3, and we've been struggling ever since. But, um, and, and, and the way that we talk to each other and, and communicate uh, came under the domination of sin also. Even the way that Adam and Eve uh, talked to each other and began to defend themselves, even uh, when sin made its, made, its, made, its, made its entrance. This is the principle that we want to operate from this afternoon. I want everybody to repeat it with me. The principle is understanding before action. Everyone say that. Before action. action before understanding can lead to disaster. Now what we mean is, is that understanding before action communication is about understanding the person that you're talking, that you're talking to. Okay? 
It's not only just what you say, but it's also how the other person perceives what you have said. Because you can say something and it can be clear as crystal to you. And it may be as clear as mud to the person that you just spoke to. You ever had the opportunity to talk to someone and then you'll say something and they'll say, and then they'll repeat it back to you and you'll say, where did you get that from? I didn't say that. You ever had that experience? Huh? And, 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 and sometimes you may have to go back and forth until they're, you're on the same page of understanding. And one of the reasons, one of the things that we find out, Carmen and I find out uh, a lot, we are biblical counselors specializing in marriage and family. And so when couples and families come to us, one of the big obstacles for family disruption is that they don't know how to talk to each other. Regardless of where they're from, they don't know how to talk to each other. And they're either talking roughly or, or, or failure to understand completely. Well, I'm going to veer just a little bit. Take it. Hello. <coughs> that one? <laughs> you know, for 41 years, I was a teacher. I know. <laughs> and I retired about two and a half years ago. So the teacher in me is coming out. And so this is what I'm, I want to say. To my young people up in the balcony... If you cannot be still, and if you cannot pay attention, and if you have to talk to each other, then you need to go sit with your mom or your dad. Are we okay? Thumbs, thumbs up. up. Thumbs up if you're okay. Okay, with me. all right. Okay. All right. They gave us a thumbs so up. Much. All okay. right. Okay. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You have to understand, and understanding does not mean that you agree with what another person is saying. It simply says that I see where you're coming from, okay? And, and we should do that before we react. Now, what the challenge of it is, is, is and I think that Proverbs 18.2 kind of sums it up in terms of the society that we're living in today. A fool finds no pleasure in understanding but delights in there in his own opinions. Now, we're living in a, in a time now where everybody wants to talk and nobody wants to do what? Listen, okay? So we find, we find uh, in society, in our homes, everywhere, people trying to talk over each other, believing that if I can talk louder than you, if I can raise my volume louder than you, then I'll be heard. And what you have is a ball of confusion. Because you have a lot of noise, nobody's talking, and everybody leaves uh, not on the same page of, uh, of understanding. Ralph, Ralph Waldo Emerson, a very um, uh, famous poet, once said, it is a luxury to be understood. Yep. Here's how, how, how humans communicate. There are two ways that we communicate. We communicate and show emotions through words and deeds. We communicate through mind and mouth. The main tool is words. Words are conveyed in the context of the physical and the emotional. The emotional is mainly attitude. Now, with words and deeds, we have a problem because most of us, uh, as humans, have foot and mouth disease. <laughs> Amen, anyhow. No? In other words, you, ever, you will say things and then you say, Man, I wish I hadn't said that. Or I wish I hadn't said it that way. Because our words that we, that we use with one another are injurious. They can, they can do more damage than a, than, a, than a gun. Come on, say amen. You can literally cut somebody up with your tongue. And that's why the Bible tells us in, in the book of James, you know, this little, this little thing inside our face, inside our mouth, is a dangerous fire. You know, because on the one hand, we can, we, can, we can bless God, and on the same, with the same tongue, we can curse men. You know, and, and, and God said, this should not be. You know, so we have to be very careful with our words. And a little later in this presentation, we're going to test you with that because we're going to ask you to do some, do an exercise where the use of words 
is very important and very key uh, when, you're, when you're talking to one another, and especially in the, fla- in the family setting. We can say things to each other as family members that can be injurious, and sometimes it takes years to undo, and sometimes almost irreparable. And this is why, parents, you have to be students of your child. In other words, you have to figure out how your child is. You know, we have, I don't care how many children you have in your home, they're all different. So you have to understand your child and also understand their ways. Because I had a child that he wouldn't talk back to me. He wouldn't, he wouldn't talk back to me. My, my son Griff, he would always tell me, well, Mom, you know, I don't understand and that kind of stuff. That's Griff. Now, Carlos was different. Because Carlos wouldn't say anything, but he'd do this. <laughs> he'd walk away and go. So he was screaming at me, wasn't he? Uh-huh. uh-huh. He was screaming. So I used to have to say, Carlos, you're screaming at me. And he would say, I didn't say a word. I'd say, oh, yeah. It's all here. So you have to understand your child so that when you see them going, then you know they're screaming at you. And then you have to bring that out of them because if you don't, for the rest of your life, they're going to go. And you want, that, you want that verbal type of communication, not the body language, but the verbal. But they also words are conveyed by way of uh, our, our, uh, the physical and the emotional. The emotional is our attitude. And a lot of times we have to admit that we all need some attitude adjustment. Amen. No? And, and it's attitudes that we bring to a conversation that, become, that can become very, um, very uh, injurious. Okay? So the physical is facial expression. Because sometimes you can, what Cameron is saying right here, you don't even have to say words, but your facial expression says a lot uh, uh, about, about, uh, about it. And, and it depends on how a person is going to, to deal with you. Now, there are some simple rules in, in, in communication. One is a speaker, what we call a speaker-listener technique. And it's a very simple rule. It means that when one person is talking, the other person is supposed to be what? Be listening, okay? But there are rules for each one. The rules for the speaker, when you're talking, talk for yourself. Don't try to read somebody else's mind. Where you try to say, well, see, I know what you're thinking. Hmm? And I said, no, you don't. See, because unless you sign your name G-O-D, you don't know what I'm thinking. Come on, say amen. Huh? And it doesn't matter how long you've lived together or how long you've lived in the house. You, you might see a person's expression and stuff, but you really don't know what they are thinking. And the only way to know what they're thinking is that they have to verbalize it. That's why God gave us a mouth to speak. But he also gave us two ears, one mouth, two ears. So that means we have to listen twice as much as we as we speak, okay? So don't try to mind read. Uh, share your own thoughts, um, your feelings and your wants and your, and your action. And then, if you're the speaker, talk in small chunks. Don't try to give a person the whole load. You can say a lot in five minutes, and if you talk for five straight minutes, it's almost guaranteed that the person has forgotten what you said after, after the second minute. Mm-hmm. Because you can give too much information, and it's called information overload uh, with that. Now, um, this is where the difference between communication between men and women come. Because women can communicate, um, in a, they communicate in a different way than men. Can the men say amen? Amen. amen. Yeah, yeah. A woman can talk about five different things at the same time. That's again. This is, right? We are so good. We are so good. <laughs> I can say to Buddy, and we, when we first got married, this was a real problem, because I could say to Buddy, Buddy, you know, Pastor Garcia, you know, they just came to the international church, and you know, you know, the international church is from all countries, all over the world, Africa, you know, Africa's over there, in near Asia, back past London, and London, you know, London's got where the queen lives, and the queen lives there with her, and she lives right near to that bay. See, this is why you have men looking like this, because <laughs> we said, this conversation started with Pastor Garcia, now we are already in London, you know, so we've, we've, taken, we've taken, a, taken a tour. So you got to talk in small chunks, 
so that so that you can so that you can grab it. Now, if you've been married as long as we've been married, you can do this. Excuse me. <laughs> See, I need a time out here. I said, so I Carmen to start on something. I said, now, if you're going to give me a detail, give me the Reader's Digest version. Okay? I don't want the encyclopedia. I just want, I want the Reader's Digest version. When uh, we first got married, Betty would say, what are we talking about? And I would go, were you not listening? What is your problem? Hang with me. <laughs> but I, now I understand. I, you know, he'll say, and then I'll stop and I'll go, oh, okay. Because <laughs> I have to get back on the subject. But we had to do this from the very beginning. It was rough. But this is where the, this is where the person who is listening now can, can, only time they can break in, you break in to paraphrase, is this what you're saying? Remembering that the, that the, that the principle is, I want to understand what you're saying before I respond uh, to this. So, and you may have to go back and forth for a while. Are you saying this? No, that's not what I'm saying. This is what I'm saying. You know, um, and, and you have to let the person finish with that. And sometimes when we counsel couples or we, we tell people, if you're going to be the speaker and you don't know how to be quiet, if you don't know when to stop, get yourself one of those egg timers. And if, yeah, I know. But if, you know, put it to five minutes and when that thing bings, then your time is up. It's time for the other person to speak. But we want to do a lot of talking. And so, we, and so there's another rule for the listener, OK? The rules for the listener paraphrase what you hear. In other words, be able to repeat back to the person what they have just, what they have just said to you. You, can't, you can ask questions, but you cannot rebut during, during that time. And you cannot make faces or use body language when they're talking to you. Someone's talking to you and you're doing, rolling your eyes. You've shut down, you've not listening at, at all. Now, people will say that the best way to know that you have a person's undivided attention is by what? Eye contact, okay? Even that you have to be very careful with, even culturally. See, from Carmen's the Hispanic um, uh, culture, it's, it's impolite for a child to look a parent in their eye and talk. Yeah. Shows disrespect, okay? Um, but you can look someone straight in the eye and be talking to them and be doing this. Because you're already, you already trying to formulate your response to that so you're not listening. Sometimes you have to do what my grandson, my grandson did to me one time. He, he, when he was smaller, uh, I was in the, in the room and I was reading the magazine and something and he was talking. He said, Grandpa, are you listening? Oh yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm listening to you. you know? And he kept on and kept on. So finally he just stepped over to me, took his little hand, lowered the magazine, grabbed me by my face and said, Grandpa, I'm talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> And sometimes you think you want, you want to do that with, with, with adults, you know, you want to say, like, I'm talking to you, you know, because you, you want them to listen. Now, here's where Matthew 7, 12 comes into play. It's a Bible text that we, that we paraphrase a lot. And it simply says, paraphrase, it says, do unto others as what? You do unto them. We paraphrase that, that text a lot. So that if you want someone to listen to you when you're talking, then pay them the courtesy of listening to them when they're talking. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then when you want to talk to somebody, choose, choose a good time to talk to them. If I, <laughs> if I really want to talk to Buddy about something serious, I am not going to pick the time when the Dallas Cowboys are playing. Because <laughs> he's not going to listen. And especially if Romo, who hopefully will be playing next season, and he throws the football, I'm not going to get in front of him and say, honey, we need to talk. <laughs> because that's not a good time. The same thing with your children. You got to pick a time to talk with your children. Now, when my son did something, he did something. It was it nice? And I told him to come, and he said, "Mom, I'm I'm really sorry." And I went, and he knew that if I start going, I'll be back, Mom. I'll talk to you later. He knew, because that means, don't talk to me now, because I'm going to really give it to you if you talk to me now. So even messages that we give our children, this is not a good time to talk. Come at a later time. Or you can say, 
Griff, this is not a good time to talk. I need to talk to Dad right now about the punishment that we're going to give you. <laughs> and then he would walk away and go, pray for me, church. <laughs> Somebody better pray for you. But those are the kind of messages that we need to give our kids. If I say to you, that's not the time to talk. Or just say, not a good time to talk right now. But you have to communicate, not just with each other, but also to your children. All right? Listening like a Christian. The most important part of communication is the ability to listen. Listening requires paying attention, mental effort, and a willingness to give heed. That means being affected by what you hear. Talking is self-centered. Listening is other-centered. And that's a hard lesson for us to learn because of the fact that we are basically a narcissistic people. Everything's about us. You see? And it started in the Garden of Eden with, uh, in, the third, in the third chapter. You notice the, the dynamics. You ever uh, study the dynamics? The last week's Sabbath school started, this Sabbath school quarterly is great because last week it started out with the fact with you know, crisis in Eden. And, and um, uh, Eve gets gets baited by the devil at the, at, the, at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then she brings Adam into the being, into the, into the uh, scenario. And then things changed for them relationally, not only with their, between their relationship with God, but the relationship with, with one another. Because they ran in here when they heard God walking in the cool of the day. They ran and hid themselves. And when God called out to Adam, he says, well, Adam, where are you? And Adam didn't say, we heard your voice. We were afraid and we hid ourselves. <laughs> he said, I was afraid. I ran and hid myself because I was afraid. What about Eve? Well, this is, Eve's on her own, you know. <laughs> I guess, you know, that talk to her. You know, but it's all about us. It became self-preservation for, for that. And that's been the problem with our ability to communicate with each other ever since Ever since that, ever since that time. And so God has been, been acting, trying to get us out of that. And one of the reasons why, why I believe that God put us in families is that so that we could learn how to interact with one another, how we could effectively learn how to effectively communicate with each other in love so that when we go outside of the home, we know how to relate to, to each other. A lot of problems that we see in the church with mem church members not being able to communicate with each other. Many times it has nothing to do with something that has happened in the church, but something rather than something that took place in the home that they, didn't, that they did not get resolved. Listening demands that you pay attention with your ears and your eyes. And listening to God is evidenced by doing what he, what he says. Um, we listen to God. We listen to, um, to, one, uh, to one another. Okay? Now, this is a fun part because men and women do communicate differently. We already kind of demonstrate that a little bit. Women can talk. Let the men say amen. Amen. Mm. A woman will talk and she just wants a man to listen to her. But men are built a different way, ladies. We are built because we are basically problem solvers. God made us to be protectors. And providers. Let the men say amen again. Yeah? yeah. And so if you give us a problem or, or ask us a question, we will come up with an answer because we are by nature problem solvers. Now, where it comes, where we get into trouble, men, though, is this. Sometimes a woman doesn't want an answer for something that she asks because she's intelligent enough. Say la amen, ladies. Amen. Yeah. She don't need a man to answer questions for her. Say amen again. <laughs> Y'all awful slow. <laughs> Sometimes she just wants to talk, and she just wants a man to listen to her. For example, my husband and I are riding along in the car. I look up, and I see this building. I don't remember that building being there before. So I say, I wonder how long that building's been there. Question. So he question. says, so he says, how would I know that? How would I know how long that building's been there? I don't know how long that building's been there. So I just went, 
I didn't need an answer to that. I just, just wondering. It's, a, it's almost a universal thing that many times, ladies, you would talk and you will put a question mark behind a statement that you will make. Now, it sounds like a question to a man, and so the man is going to see this as a, as a request for information. We will give you one. You ask us a question, and so she'll say, um, I, didn't, I wasn't looking for any answer. I was just making a statement. Then why did you put a question mark behind it? Yeah? If you study grammar, you know you a question mark requires an answer. Somebody say amen, huh? Yeah? But that always gets us, in, gets us into trouble, and it goes for, for a debate. So, so what you have to do, if you, especially if you're married, gentlemen, and that still is a problem for you, you know, um, 45 years of marriage, just tell me, and, I, and I'll say, Carmen, now is this a question? <laughs> A real question, or are you just making a statement? And sometimes she'll say, I'm just making a statement. Oh, okay, okay, so nothing's changed. Okay, <laughs> you're, still, you're, still, you're still asking questions that you don't want no answers for. So, so, so you had to deal with that because men and women uh, talk, uh, deal with each other uh, differently. Men, women like to talk a problem out because this builds intimacy. But men prefer to arrive at a quick, practical solution. Now, there's a reason for that. Women are more detailed than men. So when they talk, gentlemen, they feel like they have to give us a scenic tour. So the worst question you could ever ask your wife when you come home is, how did your day go? You might as well pack a lunch. Because this is going, you're going to get every minute detail of conversation that went on in that, during that day, you know. And you just said, you know, when you finish, get to a point. Is there going to be an intermission in this? Because that's what you want to ask because this, goes, this is going to go on and on and on. And when women talk, they, 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 they are more, not only more detailed, they're more relational. When women get to talking, ladies, what do you talk about when you get together? Come on, tell me, talk to me. What do you talk about? You talk about what? How you feel? You talk about kids? Okay. What else you talk about when you all get together? You talk about husbands? Yeah, we get, we get chewed up by y'all a lot. But just, <laughs> just, uh, huh? Huh? Fashion, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. See, men don't do that. See, men, men, don't, men don't do that. See, women, w- men get together, and if a man meets another man for the, maybe for the first time, probably within the first five minutes, that man is going to ask that other man, what do you do for a living? Hmm? We want to ask that type of thing. We'll get, maybe talk about sports and types of things. Women are more communal than men. Yep. Okay? Because women will, one lady might say to another, you know, uh, hi, sweetheart. She said, uh, I'm going to the bathroom. Come go with me. And they said, okay. So you don't see men doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and especially in this light of the society today, we, 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 you definitely ain't going to do that. <laughs> basic, basic difference. Basic difference. But it's true because I walked into a men's bathroom accidentally, accidentally. I walked into a men's bathroom and there were four men at urinal. Nobody was saying a word. There were no flowers on the wall. There was no mirror. There was no lotion. It looked like a dungeon. It really did. They didn't hear me come in, so I just kind of went back. But when you go into a woman's bathroom, you got flowers, you got a mirror, you got lotion on the counter, yeah. and if another woman comes in and you got the lotion on, I say, oh, oh, girl, this is some good lotion. Come smell my lotion. <laughs> so, and I don't even know her. Or I'll say, girl, that's a nice blouse. Where did you get that? And she'll say, I got it at TJ Maxx. I said, no kidding. And she said it was only $5. And we're just be talking away, you know. But But that's the practicalness of men. We go to the restroom and we know what we're doing in there. We're coming out, don't want no conversation. You want to talk to me, wait till I get outside. You know, that's how we, we don't, we don't need no couch. Don't need no, don't need no flowers. Go in there, do your thing and come on out. You know, we'll talk, we can talk, we can talk later. But that, but that, and the thing about it is, folks, there's no right or wrong to that, but there, 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 but there are recognized differences, and we have to recognize the differences and, and respect the differences. You know, and many times women want men to communicate the same way they do, and it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. 
because they're, they're, they're basically different. Men are never going to communicate with women, but we can respect the way that you, that you communicate, and we want you to expect, uh, respect the, uh, the way we communicate. Women expect a man to open up and talk about his feelings. A man expects a woman to always be rational and logical. Now, talking about feelings is very difficult for, for most men. Most of them because of our, of our upbringing. Men were, there are actually four pillars to a man's heart, but there's only emphasis only on two, being a provider and being a protector. And the third one that we never talk about much is that a man is supposed to be a mentor to all of those within his realm, passing on values to those that are in his realm. And then the fourth pillar that he has is, is the friendship pillar or the love pillar. When women say that men are not emotional, and uh, that, that's not true, because it's that, it's that pillar in a man's heart that serves as a cement to mo and, and a motivator for the rest of the, those things to happen. Unfortunately, being a protector and being a provider are the things that are, have been emphasized from the time when we were little boys. Little boys were expected, are expected to be tough and rough, you know, and, uh, and we deal with them even if you've got a son and a daughter, you deal with that son and that daughter differently even when you're raising them. Little girl will try, try to start walking and stuff and, and you'll say, that, come on, sweetheart, let, come walk to daddy, you know, and she'll fall down and, <clears throat> and uh, I mean, she might scrape her knee and something. You run over there and you want to pet her and you say, oh, sweetheart, you're going to be okay. And you hug her up, you know, and, and just love her good, you know. But the little boy, you know, he falls down and he says, and he's crying and says, what? <laughs> Are you... Are you crying? Come on, you're all right. You're all right. Just brush yourself off. You're all right, man. You big, you tough, you know, you like that. And that's the way we were geared. All through, all through our bringing up to be tough and, 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 and rugged with that type of thing. And then we, we grow up to be men, and then we, are, we move into a relationship where the speaking and talking about feelings is not an option. It, it, it's a must, and we don't know how. When couples have come to us for counseling, and, and she'll say, well, he doesn't tell me how he feels. I said, maybe he doesn't know how to do that. Because that's difficult. Because sharing of deep feelings for a man puts a man in, uh, makes a man feel vulnerable. And no man wants to feel vulnerable. Now, gentlemen, where we have to, especially if you're married, and if you're contemplating marriage, this is something that you have to, have to be, be, begin to overcome. Because if you enter into a marriage relationship, then you're entering into a relationship where you're marrying and, and, and uniting with an individual that's supposed to be your, close, your best friend. And you have to be able to open up to one another in order to be able to make that, that relationship a strong, have a strong bond with that. She can't read your mind and she can't always read your expressions. You know, she wants to be told, you know, how you feel. Do you love her? She, I may ask you, do you love me? She said, but you never say you love me. You know, so she has to hear that, hear that a lot. And don't be like one man said when, in a seminar similar to this. And, and I said, how many men have told, the, to, to, how many of you tell your wives that you love her? And one man just pounced up and he says, I told her that I loved her when we first got married. And I told her if anything changes, I'll let her know. <laughs> I said, you might need an escort out, brother. Cause I think you're going to have... You have some problems when you get home. You see, you see. But but God gave us a tongue to be able to, to talk and to communicate. And people need to hear words of affirmation. They need to hear words of, of affection from each other. And it's not unmanly to tell the one that that the ones that you live with, and especially if you're married, to tell your wife how you feel, that you love her, and that and that that it's okay for you to be vulnerable in her presence. Now, ladies, you have to guard that. Because if he, if he, once he shares his deep feelings and you betray that in any way, you're going to have a hard time getting him to talk about anything else. So you have to guard that sacredly. Absolutely. That's why I always tell women that they must be the cemetery for her husband's weaknesses. Whatever weakness Buddy has, nobody knows it but me. Whatever weaknesses I have, nobody knows it but Buddy. It ain't nobody's business. So you have to guard each other, each other's strengths, each other's weaknesses. You have to do that. Mm -hmm. 
Women feel the relationship is working as long as they can talk about it. Men think that the relationship is not working if we have to keep talking about it. You agree with that? Men, women usually are more superior to men in verbal abilities, more detail-oriented. We talked about that. Men generally are more superior in mathematical skills, in that which is concrete. Now, generally speaking, now there's always exceptions to the rule, but generally speaking, men are more concrete. That's why women are more relation-oriented, men are more logical and bottom-line-oriented. Uh, we use words in our homes that are irritating to family members, including children, that disrupt family unity. Now, this is where the exercise is going to come in today. Part of good communication between individuals is that you, especially in the home setting, above all else, you have to be honest with each other. Nobody can read your mind. <clears throat> Many people, we, some, there are words sometimes that we use with each other that are either aggravating or caustic and every time they say that word or phrase, it makes the little the hair stand up on the back of your neck. You actually feel, you, know, you actually get angry, but you've never told your husband or your wife or your, fa or your children or your children have never told you that that word, every time you speak it, is offensive to them. So honesty has to come into strong play in your, in your communication. For example, Carmen and I, were, uh, for a long time, and I can't remember how many years it, it went by. When something doesn't make sense to me, you say something that doesn't make sense to me, I'll just boil it down to one word, and I'll just say, that's really dumb. No. Well, I've said that for years. And then one day, I guess I must have called her leaning wrong or something. You know, and I said, she said something, and I said, you know, that's really dumb. And she got up. And she started marching around, and I couldn't even keep up with her. And she said, I am not dumb. I have a bachelor's. <clears throat> I've got two master's degrees. I've got an honorary doctorate, and I got this. And I said, I didn't ask you for your resume. What did you, did you, you, you where, where did this come from? Where did this come from? She said, I'm just telling you that I'm not dumb. I said, I didn't call you dumb. I was saying that what you said was dumb. You know, but see what happens is that we attach, if we say something, make a statement, a person attaches that to themselves. Come on, say amen. Yeah? So when I said that what she said was dumb, she, she took it to, say, to mean that I was calling her dumb. So I can't use dumb anymore. I had to come up with something else. It wasn't easy at first. It wasn't easy at first because the first time and I felt the D word building up in my chest. And, and I said, that's not very intelligent. I said, oh. yeah, that didn't go over too good either, did it? Huh? So, so we had to change, and, and, and so I can't use the D word, the dumb word, in, in our home anymore. And uh, so I had to come up with it. And sometime when I can't come up with something, I said, I just don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a, that's a safe route. That's a safe route, you know. <laughs> so we don't use that one. So... We had to come to a, a, a consensus that that word is not used in our home anymore, amongst the Griffith home. The other one was a very a caustic phrase when she would say something and I would just say, shut up. I know. <laughs> Nobody, young or old, likes to be told to shut up. Come on, say amen. Because there's no, you don't say it easily. You don't say, oh, <laughs> shut up. You, no, you, you, you put your face into it and you want them to be quiet. And you, shut up. You got the facial expression. You got the intonation. You got the whole thing. And so we don't even let our, when our grandkids come over to the house, and there are many of them are teenagers, we don't even let them say that, that, that use that phrase. Because one day they were upstairs and they were talking, they, they were, and it got pretty heated up there. And then some of them, one of them said, oh, you shut up. We said, how could you have said that a different way? They thought for a moment. Would you please be quiet? <laughs> hmm? See, we can be very offensive with words. So here's the exercise that we want you to do now. Okay? If you're with your family, I want you to get with your family, young and old, because this is a time when the kids can get involved in this. If you're not with your family, get with another group because what we discovered is regardless of what language you, you, you speak, there are words that we use that are offensive to each other and, and we won't tell each other. 
I would never have known that that word had been crawling at her until she became, till it became volcanic and, it, and, I, and she blew up all over me. Because we are not made to suppress feelings. If you suppress feelings without verbalizing them, at some point, those feelings are going to become volcanic and it's going to blow up at some point and usually at an inconvenient time. You can be arguing with each other and you may be saying something and because you haven't expressed that, that thing will become volcanic and it can happen in the grocery store. She might say to you, you and your husband, your husband and wife go to a store and you might want a can of peas and he said, can you go over and get me a can of peas? And so he brings you back uh, a can of Del Monte peas. And she says, why'd you get Del Monte? I always get Green Giant. And you went over there and got Del Monte. Why would you do that? Well, this ain't, this ain't got nothing to do with the peas, okay? This ain't got something to do with something that took place some time ago, but now it blew up and the peas become the focal, the focal point. Are you following me? Huh? Okay. Okay, so here's what we want you to do. If you're with your family, I want you to huddle together for, and we're going to give you five minutes to do this. Talk about words. Come up with words that are caustic or irritating that's used in your home, okay? And then f give us a substitute. We're going to give you about five minutes to do this, and then we're going to come back together, and this is where we're going to learn from each other because you're going to find out that there are a lot of words that we use, regardless of, of, of our families, that we use uh, because society has impacted us and those types of things that we need to, once we identify them, you have to make sure that you don't use those words in your home again, now knowing that it's offensive to a family member. Okay, you understand? Okay, let's do it. Get into your groups. There will be movement, and I need to see talking. I need to see talking. Okay? Get with your family. And children. If you're not with the family, if you're not with the family, get with someone. Get to, with another group. It's okay to get with another group. And children, speak now. Forever hold your peace. Speak now. Now, I see some folk that are just sitting, not with a group, and I want everybody to get into a conversation with somebody, because this is how we learn from each other. Thank you. 
one that I shall never forget is the one with that voice in it. The voice in it. Just that. Well, one of the things that we'll establish here is that name calling is a, is a big number. <coughs> I'll give you two more minutes. Two more minutes. Make sure you come up with substitutes now. Okay, we're going to come together now. This is where we're going to be a, be a help to each other because I'm going to point to certain, certain ones, certain groups, and I want you to identify the caustic words that you came up with and then the substitute. And if you fail to get a substitute, then that's where all of us are going to help. Okay? Now, let me say this as we, as we get into this. This is not just an exercise just to have you doing something this afternoon. We want you to take this very seriously. So that when you, when, words that you identify, because you might have learned something today by talking to, to each other, and we hope that you'll continue these, this type of conversation when you get back to your home, because this, if you want good, um, to, to create an environment, a good environment in your home, uh, everybody say the word safe. 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 Okay, S-A-F-E. We have to create a safe environment within our homes. And a safe environment means a place where I can feel like I can be who I am as an individual. I can express my opinions and feelings without fear of criticism, without fear of name calling, without fear of being rejected. A place where I can feel like I'm being understood and that I can understand. Okay? That's a safe place. If we create that kind of safe place in our homes, then our churches become safer places. Okay? And then everywhere we, everywhere we go. And so that, that, become, that becomes the, uh, the, the goal here. So we want you to be able to continue this and, this and and have this kind of conversation with your family in a family circle, you know, and help. And especially if you have, still have children in the house um, uh, under your roof, to help them identify. Because as parents, we say things to our kids that we think that we have a right to say that simply because we are adults. And we can offend our children uh, and, 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 and damage their self-esteem and self-worth just by the things we say. You agree? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes, and I wish that uh, we had known this when we first got married and had children because our children didn't open up to us like they are now. Now, my, our youngest child is 40, but um, I remember that when um, they were little, they wouldn't, they wouldn't share, you know, and I wish that we knew then what we know now. Now, you know, we live in Dallas, 
and they live in proximity to where we live. They all came because they loved us so much they wanted to be near us. <laughs> And so they came, and so now when, we, when we're when we home, we get to sit with them on Sabbath and eat, and it's just a wonderful time. I love it. But they will say things to us that um, it, it blows our mind. You know, like like not too long ago, my son said to my daughter, hey, Missy, you remember the time when we did this and this and this, and they were laughing, and we were going, oh, so afterwards, I looked at my husband and I said, did you know they did that? <laughs> did you know that? They could have died, you know. But when your kids come to you, they have to feel safe to tell you anything. Right. Anything. And you have to be real careful how you react. So when they come to you and they're telling you stuff that is curling your hair, you got to go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. But inside you're going, holy cow! <laughs> but but you know their expression is, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because you want them to come to you, and not to somebody that's the same age as they are and think they know more than you as a parent. So that's why you have to make it a safe place, a place where your kids can come and talk to you. And honey, let me go a little further. What we've done in our home. We taught our kids that they can disagree without being disagreeable. There's a way to disagree without being ugly. And, and so we developed the conference table. It's our dining room. You know, that's the uh, only place we go there is on Sabbath to eat or when we have large crowds. But we said to them, whenever you need to express yourself in another way, you can call a family meeting. So Carlos, who's a grandchild that my husband and I raised, we were cleaning out his toy chest, not to, well, it's been a while, and um, he came and was taking stuff out of the trash back into the toy chest, and, and Buddy said, don't, no, no, don't, take, don't take any of that junk out of there. So he walked away. He called a family meeting. <laughs> and we didn't know what the family meeting was about. Mm-hmm. So we all met. I mean, everybody came. All the kids, all the grandkids, all of us came. It was a family meeting. And Buddy had prayer. And then Buddy said, uh, Carlos has called this conference meeting. So, C- Carlos, this is the time for you to um, say what you need to say to the family. So he gets up. And he says, and he was only like 10, Mm -hmm. and he said, I just want the family to know that my stuff is not junk. (laughs) (laughs) And then he said, thank you very much. (laughs) And that was the end of the meeting. But he said what he needed to say, didn't he? And did it in a place that was safe. And they have to be allowed to do that. So let's over here. Just somebody from a group over here. What word, caustic or ir- irritating word, did you come up with? Did you discover? Now they're looking at me. <laughs> you didn't come up with something? Stupid. Stupid. Ah. What's wrong with that? Ah, yeah. Name calling is always a no-no. Okay. So what would you say? So evidently, tell me the context of why, how that comes up. Like okay, so what would the, be the substitute, better word than that? <laughs> okay, so they need some help. So give, give us a substitute. What could they have said differently in a, in a way that a lot more loving? I don't like that. Okay, that's good. Any, any other just? Huh? I don't understand. Oh, I don't understand. That's always a safe one. <laughs> yeah. But you said nothing. Present. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, oh that's interesting. That's okay. That's okay, that's interesting. That's, that's interesting. Okay. Any other any other suggestions to, to help with that one? Okay. You gonna try to use that one? You gonna try some of use up? Those pretty one. good. Okay. Okay. Let's go on this side, back in the back. What'd you come up with? What kind of irritating or caustic word did you come up with? Yes, sir. 
<laughs> Nonsense. Give me the context in which that would be saying. <laughs> you already get, you already, come on, my brother, you already getting reaction from that one. <laughs> What do you mean? Okay. okay, good. Probably should have been said before the nonsense. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yes. What do you mean? Okay, that's, that's good. good. That's, that's good. good. I think you go I think everybody gonna love you now. <laughs> that's good. That's, that's good. good. Okay. Somebody on this side. What kind of caustic words did you come up with? I'll come back to you back there. Okay? What kind of caustic words did you come okay, up with? Right yes, ma'am. You're too naive. Too naive. Okay. Ooh. Okay. Help with that. <laughs> good or bad, first of all. Good or bad? bad? Bad. Okay. Why is it bad? Kind of demeaning, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, what's a good substitute? What'd you come up with? Oh, they need help. Uh, they need help. Okay, help them. What kind, of, what kind of substitute, a good loving substitute can they come up with? <laughs> he, he, said, he said grow up. I said, yeah. <laughs> did, we, did we clarify that you can't use a, a caustic word with a caustic word? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody give him some help. What can, what can we say? Yes, sir. What can you say? Say it a little louder. Try to be. Oh, try to be more reasonable. <laughs> I'm going to get your hand, brother. But, but first of all, are you seeing how sometimes this can be a little difficult? Yeah, it's easier to use uh, uh, strong uh, words uh, th than it is come up with something that might, and it makes you think. Yes, sir. How is that possible? Can they still think about it? Not bad. No, no, that, that's not bad. going in a good direction. Okay, no, not bad. Okay, 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 because you want to get them to talk. Okay. Yes, yes, sir. You cannot understand. That's all. Okay. That is such a cop out. You can't understand. Oh, you may not. You may not understand. Ah. Okay. 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 That'll keep the conversation going, too. Yeah. yeah. You'll have some back and forth with that. Okay. Yes, ma'am. How you say Okay. It. That's good. That's an excellent point. She talks about the intonation, that uh, an expression that you use. So it's it, okay to say. So it's it's okay for me to say, "Oh, honey, you're so naive." Is it okay for that? <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> You still got to substitute the word. Still got okay. So it doesn't work with every word. It doesn't, doesn't work with every word. Okay, let me see, get this hand. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was not going to say that what your wife just said, what does attack a person, no matter how nice you say? That's right. Not the person. Hey, 
Hey, she, she, this is good. <laughs> that up. You summed that up perfectly. Thank you so much for thank you so much for that. Yeah, because I was going to say naive is never a word you need to use. Mm -hmm. Because a person's self-esteem is so very very important. Which leads us to to, to the thing that how many how many in terms of family do you use words that are complimentary and affirming? Okay? Okay. When you give a compliment to someone, what are you saying to them? What message are you sending? You what? Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. You're, they're watching. Okay. No, they're worth it. Oh, they're worth it. Okay. What, what else? Affirmation. Okay. What else? Encouragement. Encouragement. Yeah. You send all, the, you'll send all those messages out when you, when you, when you, when you, when you do that. Um, we have to be more affirming. With, uh, with each other, more complimentary, you know, and you have to do it on a regular basis, you know, they, they, they say do, to do something for at least 30 days forms a habit. Giving a compliment every, every day to, to, uh, to, to each other, but watching the words that you, that you speak. What we discovered from this little exercise that we went is, is that what is the problem with one word responses? Because that's all basically we used. It's bad. They end the conversation, number one. And then, it, and what else does it do? Huh? Yeah, it can. Because it leaves the other person with their own interpretation of what you're saying. And, and um, um, they can come up with all kinds of things. Okay? All kinds of things. Which leads me to this other point. Well, before you go there, Buddy. Yeah. Buddy talked about complimenting each other, which is very important. But you also need to compliment your kids because they don't always get it. Um, sometimes we, um, I know as parents, we kind of want our kids to do well in school. We really do. And so if they get all A's and one C, we don't focus on the A's that they got. We usually focus on that darn C there, stick it out like a sore thumb. And so we'll say, you had a C, but you forgot all the other A's. You know, learn how to focus on what's important. If they got one C and they got 79, 1,000 A's, you want to say, I'm really proud of you, of those A's that you got. Let's work a little harder on this C. Let's work a little harder, and I'm going to hit that other part later. We but, let's, but, but what I would do with my grandson, Carlos, I would always put a little note in his lunchbox. I know you can do it, honey. I'm proud of you, sweetheart. Go get him today, honey, praying for you in your test. And he had a friend, Kyle, who um, <clears throat> never cut those. And my Carlos would go, here's another note. Here's another note. And he would open it up, and Kyle would say, did, you, did your grandma put another note in your lunchbox? He said, yeah, here's another note. And so he said to Carlos, can you tell your grandma to put one of those notes for me? <laughs> so Carlos never again complained. <laughs> so, and so I would, I would send him, I would send <clears throat> Kyle notes, you know, too. So. Yes, sir. I have seen several families where we have been taught to avoid problems, we have to stop up nonsense. Now, in a family where we have been taught to keep silent, okay? We want to create a safe environment 
family, there's a lot of dispute in the family, decide to remain silent. Are we creating a safe environment? Are we having oriented in the, our environment you to be silent? How can we create a safe environment by keeping silent? In that kind of thanks, for, thanks for that, because that was what I was going to uh, my next point. Suppose you're talking to a family member, and then all of a sudden they just go silent. Hmm? What message does your silence send to the person that was talking to you? Disobedience. You said disobedience, okay. What, what else? You don't care, okay. You don't care. What else? You shut your ears to that, okay. Okay. Ignoring, okay. okay. Insecure. Hmm? Insecure. Insecure. And these are all messages that the person who you have left to stand there by themselves, you walked away silent in your silence, and they are having all these messages in the four corners of their own head. See? Because so, they don't mean, know what you mean by that. So even in silence, you still have to communicate. Suppose you're, you're, you're discussing something. And you feel like your blood is warming. You feel yourself getting mad, you know. And admit it, you know. Don't don't tell a lie. And some and, and they see it on your expression. They say there's something wrong. You say nothing wrong. Well, you just lie, okay. But so something is wrong, okay. But e even in your silence, you still have to communicate by saying to the person, "I can't speak. I can't talk about this anymore right now." Okay. Now here's the other rule, because there's always rules to communication. Whoever in stops the conversation has to be the one to reinitiate it in a reasonable time. And that reasonable time is in less than 24 hours. Because what happens if, if it goes longer than that? Yeah, and it's going to fester. And, uh, and, uh, and then people will get mad. They'll be having two-way conversations in their own head. And by the time you come back to them, they got something they're going to throw at you. And you're saying, where'd that come from? You know, because of the conversation they've had in their head. So even in your silence, you still have to communicate. And you have to say, you have to say, I can't talk about that right now. So you can go and get yourself together and then come back at a later time. And the person who you say that to can't say, oh, no, we're going to talk about this. Not, not, yeah, yeah, not, you can't do that. Cause see, because then you're, gonna start, you're really going to start an argument, huh? You're really going to start an argument. So you have to let them go. You have to let them go, and uh, so that they can so they can get themselves get themselves together. We're gonna come back to that because there's a there's a there's a segment before we end this session that will show you will show you how sometimes it's okay to take an adult time out and what you have to do with that. And we're gonna give you that, but we wanna we wanna cover something else first before we get to that get to that point, <clears throat> because as humans, we are not always gonna agree on everything. And especially within families, not going to agree. So how do you resolve? How do you go about resolving conflict when there is one? Okay. This is suggestive. <clears throat> There's some steps to follow. First is problem discussion. You got to talk to each other. You got to employ the listener speaker technique because you got to find out where each one's perspective is, where you're coming from. Problem discussion is not problem solving. You're not even near that yet, but you're going to talk together. You've got to listen to each other with the, with the purpose of understanding where they're coming from. So now you have the issues are on the table. Then the next thing you do, which we don't like to do, is pray. You either believe Proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6 or we don't. Somebody get the Bible. You know it? Trust in the Lord? In how many ways? How many ways? That means that we're not going to compartmentalize God. That means that we can take to prayer, to take to in prayer to God, any and everything that concerns us. Because he's concerned about everything that concerns us. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will direct your path. So, so we either believe that text or not. If you pray for that, it does a couple things. Number one, it's going to soften even if it's a disagreement and where you are angry because it's hard to pray when you're mad. Yes. <clears throat> Unless you try to pray one of them prayers, Lord, bless them because they, they, they are so hard-headed. Lord, just, just soften their heart, you know, so they can see it my way. You know, God's not going to answer that prayer anyway. 
Okay? Because that, that's, that's what you call sicking God on the other person. And God doesn't sick much. You know, he's, he doesn't do that. You are, when you pray, you are asking God, Lord, come into this situation and, and give us a resolution to this. Either to compromise or show each other. Because when you're talking back and forth, then you may see something or hear something that you hadn't thought about. Because all of us sometimes put too much uh, worth on our value on our own self-worth. We think that, well, listen, I said, I know I'm right. I know I'm right. Now, you know you've said that. You know you've said that. Now, I know I'm right. And you go away, hmm, you just have to deal with it, because I know I'm right. <laughs> and you shut down. You shut down. You, you're not listening to them anymore. When you have sincerely prayed and asked God to come into it, now you're ready to deal with the problem itself. Just for a lack of, for a, say, a lack of a better term, we put agenda setting. In other words, put everything on the table, okay? And, and you know where each one's perspective is. And now you want to start brainstorming. What are our options here, okay? If you're on both sides, of, uh, uh, either side of a fence on an issue, what's our options here? What do you think? And they come up with something. And what do you think? And you come up with something, brainstorming. And then you sit there and you, and you evaluate, okay? What looks good? Because huh? the goal is to keep peace and harmony within the home. So what looks good here? And then when brainstorming, you know, sometimes it's good to even write it down. You know, write your stuff down. And what this does is it takes time. And a lot of us don't want to invest time in each other. We want to hit a thing and then bounce off and think that everything's going to turn out okay. And it doesn't. It doesn't. Um, uh, conflict resolution sometimes takes a little time, and it's going to take some intentionality on your, on or everybody's part, especially if you've got a husband and wife situation. And a lot of times we don't know how to resolve a, 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 a conflict because we never had it modeled before. Before us, some people call call each other names and hurt each other's feelings and think that that sometime later I'll, I'll come back and I'll apologize and that's supposed to be done with it and everything. Uh, or somebody says, "Well, I'm the man of the house and my decision is final." And uh, there's nothing else to be said about it and everything. And I said, well, how fair is that? You know, um, we talked about headship this morning uh, in, in, in the message. You want to operate the same way that God wants you to operate. And so you can't operate in an ugly, dictatorial, dictatorial manner because everybody can learn something no matter how old you are. Come on, say amen. amen. <clears throat> if you're not willing to change, then that means you're not willing to grow. Okay? If you want to grow, that means in certain things you've got to change. And... Um, when you're in the community of a family, you want to get input from the essential people in that family. Okay? And especially if you're, ma if you're a husband and wife, you want to hear what your wife says. She might have a, an idea that might be better than yours. So you might have to suck your male pride up a little bit and say, yeah, I could, yeah you're right on this one. You know, and move on for the betterment of the family. Come on, say amen. Huh? For the betterment of the family. Okay? And so then, through the brainstorming, Preferably, you can come up with some compromise and or agreement because everything is not as simple in a family setting as on this we must agree to disagree. There are sometimes decisions that have to be made within the family and somebody's got to make a, de make a decision on that. And sometimes you might go through this whole process and still be on the opposite sides of the fence on this, on this issue. So the question is, if you have something uh, in your home now, I'm talking specifically to men and uh, husbands and wives now. And you've gone through the process and you've gone through it um, calmly and everything, but you're still in disagreement. But this decision has to be made because it's vital to the, the furtherance of the, of the family. Who makes the final decision? Come on. Who? Yeah, it's, uh, they say, I'm hearing, I'm hearing God, but see, God... You can't, hear, you can't hear God's voice right now because he's, he's going to work through husband and wife. So who makes the final decision? Husband. Because he's head of the household? Yeah. As long as he understands that, that, the, that, that, that the head of the household, he's made the decision, but he's made it with permission by his wife. Are you hearing me? Yeah. She's, she's made it by permission of his wife. She's allowing him to make the final decision decision okay now so it, then it doesn't become his decision it becomes our decision so that if it goes sour she can't come back and say see you should listen to me <laughs> so, 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 so. Ah, so, so it, it become it becomes a joint 
decision. Family's intact because we're all in this what? Together. That's right. And that's what, and what families have to understand is that when, we, when things happen, we are all in this together. And, we, and, we want, and we're saying to the devil, you are locked out of this. You're locked out. You're not going to cause any discord here because we're, we are, what everybody? Together. Say that, that same word. Together. together. Families are together. Okay. Now, then you evaluate and, and look at, 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 at something. I'm going to move past this, baby, and, and get to this mind fix. Now, here's, here's where the problem comes in. For husbands and wives and within families of why you can't, why it's difficult sometimes to resolve conflict. When I was working on my master's, I, I came about a, uh, an author called Carol Chowak. And Carol Chowak says that people have one or two mindsets. You have a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. The fixed mindset is the belief that your basic qualities like, maybe from here, babe, mm -hmm. like intelligence or talent. Get your bike. The belief that your basic qualities, like intelligence or talent, are simply fixed traits. People spend their time documenting their intelligence or talent instead of developing them. They believe that talent alone creates success without effort. <clears throat> the growth mindset says, it's the belief that your basic qualities can be developed through dedication and hard work. Brains and talent are just a starting point. This creates a love for learning and a resilience that is necessary for success. Great people have these qualities. So let's look at how that happens when we have something that we have to resolve, a conflict. The fixed mindset person says, they believe that this is the way they are. This is the way you are, and you don't feel you can change. You will refuse to learn from your failures and experiences because this is you. And if there's a problem, then it's someone else's fault and not yours. You are okay and everyone else isn't. <laughs> That's the fixed mindset. And we teach our children how to be fixed or growth. Say, for example, that your child comes home and they failed a test. And they say to you, I failed the test. And you as a parent say, oh, honey, why would that teacher give you that test on a Friday? <laughs> she didn't give you all the information, did she? Well, it's not your fault, honey. It's that teacher's fault. You, it's, you, it's OK, honey. I'll, I'll speak to that teacher. You're in a fixed mindset, and now that kid's become a fixed mindset because when he fails the test, it ain't my fault. It's the teacher's fault. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I got that F, but it ain't my fault. It's the teacher's fault. She gave me that F. Mm -hmm. And we got parents like that. I remember parents. Why did you give my child an F? Because your child didn't do anything. <laughs> they didn't didn't turn their assignments in or anything like that. And we become that way with God. Well, I'm in this because, see, Lord, you could have changed stuff around, and it's your fault that I'm in this mess. Uh -huh. Yeah, we do that to the Lord. Now, the growth mindset says, you believe